I think there's different perceptions of what trick means. And it, it seemed to be based on a cunning or skillful act or scheme intended to deceive or outwit someone. So because of that, I changed the name and uh, I, I changed it to a tip. And I'm going to talk about subaortic stenosis and try to give you a few tips about this. So uh, I have several cases. We'll go through these quickly. The, the first one's a 56-year-old female. She's had prior, prior subaortic stenosis resection in 1972 at age 10. She's a big lady. She's had a six-month history of shortness of breath and uh, leg edema. She had a CV MRI that showed an ejection fraction of 75% with severe aortic stenosis, subaortic stenosis. And this is a pre-op echo, and what we can see here is she does have mild AI. You can see beneath her valve right there, you can see where the subvalvular aortic stenosis is. And she also had uh, an enlarged uh, tricuspid annulus, 4.4 centimeters with a mild TR. So what we did is we, we took her to the operating room and we resected this uh, subaortic uh, uh, membrane, if you will. Uh, it was roughly five millimeters below the annulus. Uh, it's circumferential. It always involves the septum and the lateral uh, LV outflow tract as well as the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And it was, it was very thick beneath the right coronary leaflet. So we, uh, we resected that, and, and then we just uh, prophylactically placed a tricuspid uh, ring in place using a Edwards MC3 ring. And this is a post-op echo, and LV is normal size, EF is, is 50, and you can see this, this is, looks better here in the subaortic area, and here's the color. Still has uh, mild AI, but the the, uh, you can see better flow through the LV outflow tract. Another patient is 47, and interestingly, she'd had a prior patch closure of an atrial septal defect in resection of subaortic stenosis at age 23. Uh, she was a big lady. She has a permanent pacemaker in place, she has severe dyspnea on exertion and wheezing, and has had progress progressive fatigue over the past year. And here's, here's her uh, pre-op echo. And again, you can see this subaortic uh, complex here. She had a peak gradient of 84 and a mean gradient of 47. So she had uh, severe subaortic stenosis. And here's her color flow. You can see that the flow is disrupted uh, in the LV outflow tract. Now, here's the surgical picture, and just to orient you, this, this is the non-coronary leaflet here, left coronary here, this is the right coronary leaflet here. The subaortic stenosis, you can see this ridge right here, this ridge right here, it goes around, and then you can see the continuation of that ridge right here, sort of underneath that blood. And interestingly, she also has extension up the non-coronary leaflet. This here is not leaflet tissue, and she had extension up under the right coronary leaflet. So we, we resected that, including the tissue underneath the leaflets, and uh, this is what her surgical specimen look, looks like. Once again, it's, it's a circumferential ring, fibrotic ring. Post-op echo shows uh, no hemodynamically significant subaortic stenosis. She still has uh, some trace AI, and the mean gradient is eight millimeters of mercury. Another patient's a 43-year-old female. She had prior septal myectomy and resection of subvalvular membrane in 2012. She has dyspnea on exertion and, ex and exertional chest pain six months duration, and, and her symptoms have progressively been worsening. She had two syncopal episodes the day prior to surgery. And what you can see here, it's not quite as obvious, but you can see that there's narrowing in the subaortic area 
right through there. She has a peak grading of 61, trivial AI. And on color flow, let me see this. And uh, what's interesting is we, we have a, a pre-op MRI. And this, this shows turbulence through the subaortic. This is clearly below the valve. And this is some other views of that where you can see the subvalvular stenosis. And this is a cross section right here where you see that where, it, where it's white in there is actually the orifice uh, where it's going through this uh, subaortic narrowing. And then this is at the aortic level where we see a little bit of AI, central AI, and you see it here also. So we, we took her to the operating room, and this is what her subaortic uh, ring looks like. It, it dissected off the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve fairly easily. It was stuck in the area of the septum. She'd had prior uh, resection, and uh, there's often scar with this ring in that area. And it, it, it extended up to the undersurface of the, of the left coronary cusp, and we resected that also. We also did uh, resected some of her septal muscle to be sure that we got all the all the fibrotic tissue out. And then this is her post-op TEE, her her uh, LV outflow tract pre had measured one centimeter and post it was 1.4 centimeters, and and they they could see no evidence of sub of subaortic stenosis, and the peak gradient was 20. She was hyperdynamic. And this is her post-op echo. You see no turbulence in the subaortic area. And then uh, another lady, a 56-year-old female, she came to see us uh, from Florida. She's had a recent symptom of dizziness precip precipitating a workup. She underwent echo, and she was found to have an LV outflow tract gradient of 40, EF 65, mild AI. And you can see the subaortic stenosis right at this level the valves up here. And again, we see it in this view, the long axis here, this subaortic stenosis is here, and uh, you know, significant subaortic stenosis. So we, <coughs> and here's the color flow with turbulence through the LV outflow tract. And then this, this is a shot in the operating room, the area of stenosis, you can see this area right here. This is the, the non-coronary leaflet here, left coronary leaflet right up here. And she had a circumferential ring. It was necessary to sharply excise it off of her septum uh, because there was not a clear plane that was in this area right here. And you can see some scar coming up here also on her uh, interventricular septum but it, it peeled off easily from the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And then her, here's her specimen. It, it looks, you know, it's glistening, it's very fibrotic, a very small opening, but circumferential. And post-op TEE, uh, one little wrinkle on this lady is that she, she had some SAM pre-op. It became evident post-op. Her LV outflow tract gradient was 27 to 29. She was very hyperdynamic, so we were, we were sure to keep, keep her ventricle full and uh, not use any uh, inotropic agents. And uh, one thing that was noted is that she had limited excursion of her right coronary leaflet at, uh, on her pre-op echoes, and once we freed that up, she had improved excursion of her right coronary cusp. And this is post-op echo, and uh, you can see the turbulence. There's, there's some SAM. We elected to treat this medically. We, we felt that uh, this would get better. And echo after surgery, EF was 60, 65. Her peak gradient uh, across the aortic valve was 14. Across her LVL flow tract was, was about 10. Uh, she had some SAM with mild MR, so we, we felt that this was a victory. In three years post-op, she had an echo, and she has mild MR with no SAM, and peak gradient across her valve of 13 with no residual LV outflow tract gradient. And now, uh, is it possible to do TAVR for subaortic stenosis? 
We have a 57-year-old female. She has significant severe Parkinson's with severe and constant writhing movements. She's mobility impaired, multiple falls. Uh, they're planning on doing, uh, putting in a deep brain stimulator for her to control her Parkinson's, and we felt she was at least an intermediate risk patient, so we uh, felt that she would perhaps be a candidate for TAVR. And these, these are some of the pre-op echoes. You can see her subaortic stenosis right here. and some, some other views. And, and this is when we're, we're deploying the, uh, the core valve. The core valve is partially deployed. We have to aim for a lower deployment because this, this was, the ring was about nine to 10 millimeters below the annulus. And this is, uh, we're just trying to get the proper position we, we couldn't get it to stay. We had a 26 valve, so we, uh, we upsized to a 29, and perhaps that's because of the lower implant and, and the, the uh, angled cork-like effect uh, in a low implant. So we uh, placed it at a depth of nine to 10 millimeters, and LV alpha track gradient post-op was 9.4. Pre-op, it, it was almost 50. And this is the... Uh, post-op shot, there's no AI, no PVL, trace MR, and this, this shows uh, the don't see much turbulence across the LVI flow tract. And this is uh, a day after, and, and again, we're, we're satisfied with how that looks. So uh, my tips with this disease, it's, it's not a common disease. I, I think that with, with uh, high resolution MRI and echo, we're going to see more of this. And it can, the, 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 another important thing is, is it can involve the aortic leaflets. And we should try, since this occurs in, in younger patients, we need to preserve the aortic valve. We're working through the aortic valve of the patient, and you don't want to injure these aortic valves. And it, you have to resect it completely, circumferentially. And if you need to take septal muscle, uh, you should do that. And you should uh, dissect it off the anterior lead for the mitral valve. And sometimes it can extend down further, and you end up doing a and arterectomy of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve also. And it's, uh, TAVR may be feasible in patients who are high or extreme risk. And uh, another tip is just to take your time in the OR, just like you, you always do, and uh, you know, do a, an, an effective and efficient operation.